and I'm deputizing today uh, for our chair, Alex Katz, who is currently in France or on the way to Germany to attend an international Council of Christians and Jews meeting. And our vice chair, Mark Walsh, he is walking the Camino in Spain. Yeah. To begin with, as is customary for us, let me uh, acknowledge the traditional owners, the original custodians of the land on which we're meeting here today. And I give my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, today, would you believe this is our first in person event in over two years? It's a long time. I mean, we've had to make do with Zoom, and, and that's good if there's nothing else available, but there's nothing really like you know, face to face in my book, anyway. And so it's my pleasure to um, not to introduce the speakers, Mary and Daisy will be, there, will be doing that in a moment, but to say, okay, today's topic is Patterson of Israel, the most amazing Jewish story of Gallipoli and the Anzac Light Horseman ever published in Australia. I have to say, I don't really know anything about that, but I thought it was indeed a very interesting topic and I certainly look forward to hearing more about it. Can I hand over to you, Marion, please, yes. to introduce our speakers? Yes. Our first speaker is going to be Mr. Christopher Bantic, who is a retired school teacher, having survived, yeah. Yeah. He taught yeah. in England and Australia. And he's also a writer, a columnist, and he's written many, many articles, including subjects of poetry and even. The, the rise and fall of dinosaurs. But his topic today is to be the Anzac lesson and legend to which we look forward very much. And our second speaker also has a past history, Dr. Henry Wu, a retired ophthalmic surgeon who listened for many years to the stories of ex-servicemen about the Anzac experiences. He's a prolific writer, has written several books, and the one that he will be talking about today <coughs> is the story of John Henry Patterson, who lived from 1867 to 1947, a contemporary of Florence of Arabia. He was an Irish Protestant, a Christian Zionist, who commanded the Jewish legions at Gallipoli. So we look forward to both our speakers on this very interesting topic. So thank you. Thank you, Marian. And uh, over to you, Christopher. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And it's lovely to see so many people here. And my role is essentially to introduce Harry, but to contextualize something of the background circumstances where Patterson of Israel is, is placed. And I was interested in the chairman's remarks that he said, I've never heard of Patterson of Israel, well, neither had I, until <laughs> Harry had written his book and all the research that I had done over a number of years on the Gallipoli campaign and particularly the culture of the Anzac tradition um, had, it, had, it, had it really excluded any references to Jews, but also references most specifically to Patterson of Israel. And in that context, I just want to remind us as to how this, this legend has become so pervasive in Australian history and in Australian discourse. And one of the things that's become, and I used to teach Australian history both here and in, in England and tutored at it at Monash University, one of the things that, I, that became very clear to me was Australian authorities that were writing about the first landing of Gallipoli had a very particular view of what they wanted the Australian community back home and indeed the dominions generally that included England, a kind of representation of who Australians were. And some of the reportage that came back from the front was extremely persuasive. The, the community wanted to know about the Australians and the language that was used was essentially that of the muscular Western Christian male. And initially when uh, the Gallipoli campaign or the Light Horse in particular 
which I'm sure Harry will refer to in due course, were uh, signing up the height measurements. They had to be six feet. So they were very imposing men. And these were men that immediately looked very different. They were different to the English and indeed different to the New Zealanders in many ways and different to the Canadians. And some of the evidence I think that's clear here, I'll just read you a couple of things that if you can imagine yourself opening a newspaper in any suburb of Melbourne on the 3rd of May and then the 8th of May when the boat, most of the reports come in, you would get a very different impression from perhaps the way we look at it today. And I'll just read you a couple of examples of this. Firstly, when the Anzacs landed at Anzac Cove on the 15th of April 1915, there was very little in the way of reports that came back. But when they did, this is what was actually being put forward. The source is the Argus, old newspaper in Melbourne, which unfortunately has closed some years ago. And the Argus actually wrote on the 30th of April, so that's only five days after the initial landing, they said this, Australians have taken their place in the fighting line and, like the Canadians, have won honour by their brilliant work. We expected this of them and knew that they expected it from themselves. The details of the operations are tantalisingly brief. We know that our troops are credited by His Majesty's Government with splendid gallantry and magnificent achievement. Magnificent achievement by our men? It is very high praise indeed coming from the official quarter, which is always courteous to the Dominions, but not want to indulge in the language of exaggeration. It now appears that the Canadians at Hill 60 and the Australians equivocally distinguished themselves in action almost simultaneously. And then, moreover, the report on the 3rd of May, another report in the Argus says this, Australians have all the high patriotism and self-control of a ruling race. And, <coughs> and they will not let their private sufferings dim their rise to the glory of wounds and death incurred by many of the countries caused by its gallant sons. It is not, however, upon the sadness of the inevitable cost of war that we should dwell, but on the stirring story of duty manfully performed and undying fame won by our courageous self-sacrifice. Australia could not wish for a more inspiring scene in which to make her European debut in a fighting unit of the Empire. There must be a hot engagement before the end is achieved, but already our troops have established a superiority. And then, probably the most persuasive statements that were really made about the first landing comes from a writer called Ashley Bartlett, a journalist. And on the 8th of May, he says this, and why I want to dwell on this for a minute, is because it is this view that actually underpins the Anzac legend or the Anzac myth. Now, the two things are different, but they do exist. And what he said was this, the Australians rose to the occasion. Not waiting for orders or for the boats to reach the beach, they sprang into the sea and forming a sort of rough line, rushed at the enemy's, enemy's trenches. Their magazines were not charged, so they just went in with cold steel. Then, this race of athletes proceeded to scale the cliffs without responding to the enemy fire. They lost some men, but did not worry. They were happy because they knew they had been tried for the first time and not been found wanting. So reading that, and indeed writing about that for some time, I was struck, uh, as I read uh, Harry's book, at just how little I knew about a particular group of people that were at Gallipoli. And it's a curious thing that we've become, in Australia in particular, very, very good at editing out of the Anzac legend anything even mildly controversial. It has to be the kind of almost censorship view of the Anzac landing that no one can transgress. Yet, when you examine it, as Dr. Lou has done, there was a whole other story. And that was the most revealing thing that I discovered in reading this quite extraordinary book. So what I'm going to do now is ask Dr. Lou some questions that relate to the books, but in the context of this wider sense of the Gallipoli legend and where James Henry Patterson fits in. So why has Patterson been written out of history? 
on all, by all sides. Yes, well, uh, this is amazing. Most people have never heard of Patterson because he was deliberately written out of history. He was deliberately written out of history by General Allenby, the commander of the British forces, because Allenby was an opponent of the Balfour Declaration. Allenby wanted an Arabic Islamic state in Palestine. And um, it didn't really suit that want of his to publicise Patterson and his troops. He was written out of Israeli and Jewish history by David Ben-Gurion. And the reason he was written out by David Ben-Gurion was that his closest friend in the army was Vladimir Jabotinsky. And Ben-Gurion hated Jabotinsky with an absolute passion. In fact, in a meeting in Tel Aviv in 1934, Ben-Gurion referred to Jabotinsky as Vladimir Hitler, and then he wrote a pamphlet on Jabotinsky titled Jabotinsky in the Footsteps of Hitler. Uh, Jabotinsky did Ben-Gurion a big favour by dying of a heart attack in New York in 1940. And he left in his will at the time that he wants to be buried when he, wherever he dies, but if there ever is a Jewish state in Palestine, he wants his remains to be transferred to that Jewish state at the request of the Jewish government there. And in 1948, his supporters approached Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion's response was that Israel is for living Jews, not dead Jews. He then, of course, immediately transferred Herzl's body to his <laughs> And he had repeated requests through the whole uh, 15 years he was in power for this to happen, and every time he rejected it. He even rejected it when people like um, uh, Yitzhak ben Svi, who was his main president after Weizmann died, continually asked him and he rejected it. And Moshe Sharet, uh, who replaced him for a couple of years in 1954-55, at the time of the Kasna trial, because Ben-Gurion didn't want to be prime minister in case Kasna was found guilty. He wanted somebody else to be prime minister. So he went off to the Negev for the duration of the trial but he was still the leader of the Mapai party. And uh, so it was not only the opposition that requested it, his own people requested it, and he continually refused. As soon as he retired from politics, the same people approached Levi Eshkol, the next prime minister. Permission was immediately granted, and Jabotinsky's remains were brought to Israel in 1963. The question you ask is why did he bury Jabotinsky and Patterson together? The reason was that Patterson was in charge of three Jewish brigades. They were called initially the 38th, the 39th and the 40th Royal Fusiliers. Patterson was in charge of all three, and, but his main position was in the 38th. And in the 38th, Jabotinsky was his second in command. In the 39th, um, there was an Australian, Colonel Eliezer Margolin, who next to Monash is the most decorated Australian Jewish soldier of World War I. He was in charge, he was with the Anzacs at Gallipoli, not with Patterson. And after the Gallipoli campaign, he requested transfer to Patterson soldiers, and he was given command of the 38th, 39th rather, in the absence of Patterson. If Patterson was there with him, Patterson was in charge, but most of the time, Patterson was not with him. And then there was the, third, the 40th, which was a division mainly of young Americans, 
which arrived in the Middle East after all the fighting was over. So they didn't actually take part in the fighting. It was the 38th and the 39th that took part in the fighting. Now, uh, Ben Gurion actually enlisted in the 39th under Margolin. When he arrived in Cairo, he suffered a severe attack of dysentery, which hospitalised him for a number of months. When he finally got out of hospital, all the fighting was over. And so he was then transferred to the 40th Division, which came when all the fighting was over. After the whole campaign was finished, uh, Patterson wrote a book titled With the Judeans in Palestine. Now, if you read through that book, the name Jabotinsky appears on virtually every page. I might be exaggerating when I say virtually every page, but it continually reappears throughout the book. The name Ben-Gurion is not mentioned at all. If, when Ben-Gurion became Prime Minister, he um, uh, had publicised Patterson, Patterson's book would have become a bestseller in Israel, and every Israeli who read it would see Shabatinsky's name all through the book and Ben-Gurion not mentioned at all. So in true political fashion, he banned Patterson together with Shabatinsky. He was also written out of history by Bean and Gullet, who were the two Australian uh, historians of the Gallipoli campaign and the Palestine campaign. Bean was a notorious anti-Semite and a great opponent of Sir John Monash, continually wrote terrible things about John Monash. Uh, so it's no surprise that he wasn't interested in including Patterson and his men in the history. So he was a victim of history on all sides. And um, at the end of all the fighting, Allenby had a special ceremony in Cairo um, where he thanked all the foreign troops who had helped the British in the Palestine campaign. He, ha he thanked the South Africans, the West Indians, the Kashmiris, the Indians, the Australians, the New Zealanders. The only foreign troops that he didn't mention at all, didn't get a mention at all, were Patterson and his Jewish troops. On that basis, as you can see, there's been, this is an extraordinary uh, man and an extraordinary omission from the story of the Harry, how did you hear about him? Well, I found out about him a rather unusual way. I go to a Wednesday, probably pre-COVID, not so much during COVID, but we've started again now. Uh, one Wednesday a month, a whole group of guys who I've known for, God knows, 60 years, um, and who I was um, a student with at school and at university, mainly medicos and dentists, uh, we go for a dinner and um, one of the guys at the dinner said that he just read a story called The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomba by Ernest Hemingway and uh, he said uh, I, and I'll tell you what the story is about uh, the story is about a safari in Africa and a husband and a wife go on safari. Now the wife has a terrible past history of being unfaithful to the husband and she indulges in an affair with the hunter. Uh, one day they go out and they get attacked by a wild boar. The hunter yells to everybody, pick up your rifles and shoot the boar. So the hunter picks up his rifle and shoots the boar. The husband picks up his rifle and shoots the boar. The wife picks up her rifle and shoots the husband. <laughs> At the end of that story, there was a brief notation that Hemingway 
base this story loosely on true events that occurred in the life of Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson, who led Jewish troops at Gallipoli and during the Palestine campaign. And this guy who brought the topic up asked us, have um, you guys ever heard of John Henry Patterson? And the only person who had is actually sitting in this room. <laughs> None of the others had. And, um, and he mentioned that uh, he had actually read memoirs by Patterson uh, many, many years ago. Patterson wrote two memoirs. Uh, the first one, we actually wrote four books altogether, um, uh, two war memoirs. The first one was called With the Zionists at Gallipoli. And the second one was called With the Judeans during the Palestine campaign. But these books, because Patterson got buried under the carpet of history as a result of these books, they also got buried under the carpet of history. But may I sort of mention that this guy, who all these people buried under the carpet of history, was not an unknown figure. He was somebody who was very widely known throughout the world before all of these things um, happened. And I think Chris wants to ask me do, the yes. next question, <laughs> and then I'll elaborate on it. <laughs> what did you find out about his ancestors? Could you elaborate on his career? Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, um, he was actually illegitimate. He was the illeg illegitimate son um, of one of the sons, who were four who would have been capable of being the father, no one knows who it was, but uh, of a prominent uh, land-owning Irish Protestant family and one of their Catholic serving maids. And um, as a result, uh, he was brought up living in like an apartment, I think you could call living quarters, above the stables of the family property. So as a young boy, he became a brilliant horse rider. You know, he was exposed to horses from the beginning. And apparently the family had a magnificent library to which he was allowed full access to. So he was very well read by the time he was about 16 or 17. And one of his main interests revolved around the stories in the Old Testament. But he wasn't interested in the religious stories. He was interested in the military stories. So he was very interested in the story of Gideon. He was interested in David and Goliath. He was interested in the story of Judah Maccabee. Uh, they were the sort of things that he was very interested. But he never had any exposure to Jewish people despite his interest in this. And at about the age of 17, um, he enlisted in the British Army, underwent training in Britain, and then was sent out to India. Um, in India, the, one of the first things he did once he got there was enrol in a course to learn Hindustani which I imagine was quite a sophisticated course because he learned the language very, very well. Um, and then after he did that in India, in the British Army again, he did the equivalent of a university um, engineering degree. And uh, while he was in India, the British were building a railway and a bridge over the Tsavo River in Africa. And what started happening is that man-eating lions started coming into the tents at night and eating the workers. About half the workers were African natives and they all ran away home. The other half were indentured Indian workers and they had nowhere to go. And so the British government decided that what they need is a British soldier 
who can speak Hindustani and is sufficiently qualified to shoot lions and to build a railway and a bridge over the Tsavo River. And the man they found that fitted all parameters was Patterson. So Patterson went and shot the lions. The lions are now stuffed and you can see them in a museum in Chicago. Right? He then uh, built the railway and built the bridge. Um, once all this was done, he was then transferred back to England where he then served as um, a soldier in the Boer War where he was highly decorated, won a distinguished service order which he received from King Edward VII at Buckingham Palace. Um, what I've missed at the moment, which is also very relevant to who the man was, uh, he was a, what you'd call a ladies' man extraordinaire. <laughs> and um, on, um, I think, the way back from India to England, he met this extraordinary woman on the boat who had been a headmistress of a school in India uh, she had been engaged to marry a British doctor who was working in India, but he contracted a infectious disease prior to their wedding date and actually died in hospital on the day she was supposed to get married to him. Now why I say she was an extraordinary woman was she was the first woman in Britain to get a doctorate in laws. She was not allowed to practice as a lawyer because at that time women were not allowed to practice law. So she went back to university and did a Bachelor of Science as well. So she became the first woman in Britain to have both a Doctorate of Laws <laughs> and a Bachelor of Science together. And then she was sent out to India where she became a teacher and a headmistress in a school. Uh, Patterson, uh, by the time Patterson married her, um, she was already three months pregnant, so he was, as I said, quite a ladies' man. And uh, they had a successful marriage till he died, I think, a couple of weeks before she did. Um, so um, that was another side of the story. Now, um, so we got to where he'd come back from the Boer War and the British decided they needed a good soldier to explore certain parts of Africa so they'd have a better knowledge of the geography and the terrain. So they sent Patterson out to do that and he asked the government would it be all right if on the side he conducted lion safaris? <laughs> And they gave him permission to conduct lion safaris. Um, uh, he, um, on his second safari, he had uh, a young couple, the Blythes, Audley Blythe, and his wife, Ethel Blythe. Now, they were quite a prominent British couple. Uh, Audley, uh, Blythe's father was Baron Sir James Blythe, who was director of the W and A Gilby Wine and Mercantile Firm, which is famous for Gilby's gin. Yeah. Right. And his wife's um, husband, uh, father rather, was Baron Sir John Bruner, a co-founder of ICI together with Ludwig Mond, a fellow of the Royal Society, a Jewish fellow who was a member of the Royal Society. So it was a very, very prominent family. On the safari, Blythe got ill and got recurrent infections. And uh, the next thing we knew was that he was so sick that his wife was now sharing her tent with Patterson <laughs> instead of with her husband. And Patterson claimed there was a partition in between, mm. right? Um, but um, 
while they were on the safari, uh, the husband eventually committed suicide. And uh, Patterson arranged for his body, he shot himself in the head. Patterson arranged for his body to be buried there and then and continued on with the rest of the exploratory task they were undertaking before he went back to, I think it was Nairobi. Um, so that when he arrived in Nairobi and people found out that Baronet Blythe's son had died on the safari and that his wife had been sharing a tent with Patterson, Patterson immediately got arrested and was charged with murder and adultery. And because of the connection of uh, Blythe and his wife being British lords, Patterson had to be tried in the House of Lords. <laughs> now, uh, a number of natives who were on the safari with him gave evidence that when the shots were fired uh, that killed Blythe, Patterson was talking to them 400 metres away from the tent where Blythe was inside. So he was immediately acquitted by the House of Lords uh, of actually murdering Blythe, but he didn't get off the adultery charge and uh, he got thrown out, disgraced, from the British Army, right? Uh, he came back to England for the trial on the same boat as Ethel Blythe. And about eight months after he came back, um, Mr. and Mrs. Patterson had a child. There is no record of the birth of that child. There is no birth certificate. Uh, Patterson had had two earlier children with his wife, Frances, who had both died in infancy. And Frances was now getting to an age where women had much reduced fertility. And so it was postulated that the child that became Patterson's child who survived was actually Ethel Blythe's child and not his wife's child. And his wife, I suppose, being an intelligent and progressive woman, decided at about the age of 40 that uh, she'd rather have a surrogate child that was her husband's rather than have no child at all. So the child was brought up uh, by Patterson and his wife as their own child, even if it wasn't their own child. The grandson was asked at a later date, do you believe that Mrs. Patterson was your grandmother? Or do you believe that Ethel Blythe was your grandmother? He said, it makes absolutely no difference because either way I'm impeccably bred. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it was never a problem. Um, but Ethel Blythe left England and went to live in New Zealand uh, shortly thereafter. So um, that was sort of the end of her position in the Patterson story. Patterson then wrote a book called The Man Eaters of Tsavo, uh, which became a bestseller and remained in print for 50 years. It was never out of print. There were six B-grade movies made by Hollywood based on the book. He was invited to the White House by Theodore Roosevelt, who as well as being president at that time, was a famous hunter. And uh, Roosevelt became a lifelong friend. He visited the White House again at a later date. And when Roosevelt came to King Edward VII's funeral, he visited Patterson and had dinner in Patterson's house. So this is what I'm saying. At the time, he was leading the Jewish troops. He wasn't a person who was unknown to the world. He was a very widely known figure who was deliberately written out of history.
just keeping in mind just the story that Harry has told and the story that he told me when we initially started to talk about the book, we both suggested almost simultaneously that Patterson is almost like a James Bond figure of today in terms of his capacity to do all these extraordinary things and then to be able to give that great line, I'm impeccably bred. <laughs> well, will I go on with his yeah, please, yes, do so. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when World War I started, Patterson got a burst of patriotism and wanted to join the British Army again. So he went to the London War Office and said he wanted to offer his services and they told him get lost. So at his own expense, he then took himself out to France and volunteered his services and he was told by the High Command to get lost and go back to England. Because he'd been disgracefully discharged yes. from the British Army. So he then found out that one of his mates from the Boer War days was in Cairo. So he took himself out at his own cost to Cairo and met with this person. And he was told, there's only one job available for you here. It's a job which no other British officer wants to take. There are a lot of young Russian Jewish Zionists who the Turks have expelled from Palestine and are now in Cairo and Alexandria. And you have got three weeks to train them into a mule train for Gallipoli. You've got to train them how to load mules, how to unload mules, how to take food, water and ammunition from the ships to the front. But you haven't got time to train them how to use guns or to fight. You've just got to train them to do that. So he met up with all these young men. He started training them uh, 18 hours a day and he found that in three weeks he could train them to be a brilliant mule train and brilliant fighters as well. Now, uh, at the time he was given command of this, Jabotinsky and Trumpeldor were both in Egypt. Jabotinsky didn't want to go with Patterson because it was not a fighting brigade, it was a mule train. Trumpeldor said it's all the same thing, fighting brigade, mule train, doesn't really matter. And Trumpeldor, of course, only had one arm. Lost the other arm fighting in the Russians, for the, for the Russians against the Japanese. So anyway, uh, Patterson took these guys to Gallipoli after he'd been in charge of them for about six weeks, he came to the conclusion that not only were they the smartest soldiers who had ever served under him in the British Army, they were also the bravest ones. And he said in his book with the Zionists at Gallipoli that Trumpeldor with his one arm was the best and bravest soldier he ever saw in the British Army, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and uh, he suddenly got really involved with these guys and they're all Zionists. And so he decided to become a Zionist <laughs> and he became a bigger Zionist than all of them. He fought with them at Gallipoli. Uh, he wasn't there for the last month or so because he contracted an illness. And in the last month, Trumpeldor led them. But um, while he was recuperating in hospital in London and he was writing his book with the Zionists at Gallipoli, Jabotinsky came and paid him a visit. And Jabotinsky said that he's negotiating with the London War Office to have a division of Jewish troops, a fighting unit, to go to Palestine and fight the Turks with the British. And is there any way that Patterson can help him to get an in and an introduction into the British War Office? So Patterson actually took him and introduced him to a chap called Major Leon Amory, who was an MP and a member of the War Cabinet. And Amory managed to push Jabotinsky in the right direction 
and the war office uh, allowed him to form a Jewish battalion. And um, Amer is quite an interesting guy in himself because uh, one of his parents, I think it was his father, or it may have been his mother, um, was half Jewish, Hungarian. Um, so he had a Jewish connection, but in World War II, he had a son who uh, was, he was told during the son's school years that he was the worst student they'd ever seen at every school he was at. And he ended up going to Germany during the war, becoming a Nazi, and giving broadcasts over the radio like Lord Hall. And Amory's son was actually hung by the British after the war. So that was an interesting little connection there as well. Was he Lord Hall? No, no, he wasn't Lord Hall. was just one, one of a group. So, um, anyway, um, Patterson said to Jabotinsky that now you've got a Jewish legion to fight in Palestine. Uh, this time, what you've got to do is you've got to get yourself a Jewish officer to lead them. Um, and he said there are a number of Jewish officers in the British Army, all of whom would be suitable. But when the War Office uh, gave Jabotinsky permission to have this division, they said to him, who do you want to lead this division? And he said, there's only one man in the world who can lead this division, and that's John Henry Patterson, and that's the man I want. And, uh, uh, you know, very shortly thereafter, I think it's fair to say that um, Jabotinsky's best friend in the world became Patterson, and Patterson's best friend in the world became Jabotinsky. And Jabotinsky referred to Patterson as one of the most significant Christian figures our, pa our people have ever met since the dispersion in 135 AD. And uh, Patterson said of Jabotinsky that Jabotinsky is the Jewish Winston Churchill. He said the difference between Jabotinsky and Churchill is that when the British were in real trouble, and there really wasn't anybody to save them. They finally, you know, bit the bullet and gave the position to Churchill. But the Jewish people never gave it to Jabotinsky. Um, so, of course, um, he led the Jewish troops in Palestine and he became absolutely horrified by the amount of anti-Semitism that they were exposed to by the British. Uh, it was just absolutely horrific. Um, and uh, he became uh, a fighter against the British Army, against the horrible anti-Semitic behaviour that was continually and repeatedly being directed towards his troops. Um, so much so that he became the only British soldier in the history of World War I who started the war as a lieutenant colonel and ended the war as a lieutenant colonel. The only one in the entire British Army. All the others had been promoted to higher ranks. In your own research, Harry, how difficult was it to actually find material and sources on Patterson? Well, the first thing I did when I came home that evening after dinner was I went on the internet um, to see if I could find copies of his memoirs. And I managed to find one copy of With the um, Zionists in Gallipoli and one copy of With the Judeans in Palestine. They're both very rare books. And I don't think they had second editions. Uh, so I got those and then I started to look around and there were a, a few other books available. If I can, actually I can mention them to you, if I can just grab. I've got a copy here. Oh, you've got a copy there? Yeah. 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 Um, because I've got them in the index here. Um, 
There was a book um, written by Patrick Streeter called Mad for Zion, a biography of Colonel J.H. Patterson. Okay. Yeah, but uh, Lieutenant Colonel it was, yeah. But um, he, um, Streeter's interest was rather unusual because Ethel Blythe, the lady who came back on the boat from Africa with Patterson and probably contributed to Patterson's child was Streeter's great aunt. And he was fascinated to learn about this guy who his great aunt had had an affair with. <laughs> so that was his impulse for studying Patterson and reading and writing the book, you know. The other person who wrote a book was a chap called um, Dennis Bryan, who was an elderly journalist, who wrote a book called The, Second, the Seven Lives of Colonel Patterson. Seven Lives. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, look, it's got a lot of detail in it, and from that point of view, it's a very good book. Um, but um, I sort of found it a little bit distant, mm. you know, whereas when you actually, and then there was a third book, yeah, there was a third book, um, that I used by a guy called Mike Evans called Friends of Zion and that was about Patterson and Ward Wingate together in the one book. Um, but um, Ward Wingate often uh, gets described as the godfather of this, the uh, Israeli Defence Forces but it's quite acknowledged now in Israel that if there was a godfather of the Israeli Defence Forces it was the guy who actually led divisions of Jewish soldiers for the first time in 1900 years, and that's Patterson. Um, Patterson now is actually buried in Israel. Uh, he was buried there in 2014 at the request of his grandson, because his grandson said that it was uh, his request on his death to one day be buried in a cemetery in Israel where other soldiers who served under him were also buried. And a lot of the soldiers, or a number of the soldiers who served under him, um, I'll give you that yeah, um, they founded a moshav at a place called Avichayel, which is very close to Natanya. And he's buried there in the Avichayel moshav cemetery with soldiers who fought under him and there is now a Patterson Museum at Avi Hayel and there's also a Friends of Zion Museum in Jerusalem where he is featured very prominently as well. Um, when he was buried in Israel the burial service was conducted by Benjamin Netanyahu who knew of Patterson very, very well, because his father, Ben Sion Netanyahu, was Jabotinsky's secretary in New York and had been exposed to Patterson and became a very close friend of Patterson. And as probably most of you people remember, Netanyahu had a brother called Jonathan Netanyahu, uh, who perished during the Entebbe raid, and Jonathan Netanyahu was named Jonathan after the godfather at his circumcision, who was John Henry Patterson. So this is, this is the guy who those three groups of people buried out of history. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's an extraordinary story. Um, oh, Go back to Chris. How did, how did you develop your perspective after reading the sources and uh, becoming obviously engrossed in Patterson? Yeah, well, look, my, my perspective was uh, reached by reading his own writings mm. and making a decision that for the chapters to do with Gallipoli and the Palestine campaign, rather than write it in the third person, I would edit his own books and abbreviate them and make them into those chapters. So that in those chapters, Patterson is actually speaking to you. You're not getting 
somebody else's opinion, you're getting Patterson's opinion and Patterson's descriptions. And as I said, he was the author of four books in total, The Man Eaters um, of Tsavo, another one called In the Grip of the Naika, which is also about his lion safaris in Africa. And then, of course, the two books on Gallipoli and Palestine. So he was the author in the end of four books. Yeah. So think about Allenby and why Allenby promoted Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, what, what, what Allenby, well, as I said, Allenby was an Arabist and an opponent of the Balfour Declaration. And I think, you know, most of the people here seem to be in a similar age group to me. So you may remember when television started in Australia, there was a filmmaker who you would see on television called Lowell Thomas. Does that name ring a bell for anybody? Well, Allenby, yeah, and Allenby actually contracted or allowed, whatever word you want to use, Lowell Thomas to make a movie called With Allenby in Palestine and with Lawrence in Arabia. That movie was shown to millions of people immediately after the war. It ran in New York for six to 12 months. It ran in London for six to 12 months. And I think it was shown in Paris as well. And it ended up making Allenby the pin-up British general of World War I because he was the only one who had significant victories. You know, the main British victories in France were due to a guy called Monash from Australia, not from their own generals. And uh, it made Lawrence into <coughs> the legendary cult figure that he has become, based on a story which is 90% fiction. And Lawrence, in fact, confessed this that, that it was fiction to a Colonel Richard Meinertshagen, uh, who was also very well known to Patterson, uh, when they became best friends at the Versailles conference in 1919. And uh, I think one of the reasons that um, Lawrence remained a reclusive after the war was he didn't want people to find out that his story was 90% fiction. And had there been justice in the world, uh, instead of all us people in 1962 going to see a multi Academy Award winning film called Lawrence of Arabia, we would have gone to see one called Patterson of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> the troops, it's a good movie, though. It's a good movie, yeah. <laughs> his troops idolised him. Yeah. And why was that? I think the reason his troops idolised him was that he was not a commanding officer who sat in the background and sent them into battle. He was there at the front of things, whether it was on foot or on a horse. Um, and uh, what his men actually did was they captured, but they, they, they were treated terribly. They were sent to malarial infested areas where the British soldiers were never sent. Um, they received horrific medical care in Jerusalem, in the fields, not in the hospitals. Um, it was just, you know, it was just absolutely disgraceful the way they were treated. But they actually took Um Esh Shirt Ford, which was the most important ford across the Jordan River. Um, they captured that, and that enabled um, Chevelle's forces, the Australian Light Horse to get behind the Turkish lines. And of course, immediately Chevelle got behind the Turkish lines. He cut off their supplies from Turkey. And the Turkish soldiers had to surrender in their tens of thousands. And at the same time, uh, Chater, the New Zealand general, and, and Patterson's men started off being attached to Chevelle, but then they transferred to Chater enabled Chater to avoid the Turkish troops and take Amman and also get behind the Turkish troops and cut off their supplies. And once their supplies were cut off and they had no food, they had no water, um, but all the Turks had to surrender 
and um, one of the great advantages that um, Chevelle and Chater had was there was a Jewish botanist by the name of Aronson who knew where all the water wells were throughout the whole of Palestine. So one thing that they didn't have to take when their horseman was charging, they didn't need any water. They could get the water on the way. And this was very, very important, not having to carry large supplies of water for a very rapid attack and a very um, rapid capture of places like Damascus and Amman and really a very rapid Palestinian campaign. So rapid that by the time Ben Gurion got out of hospital, the whole thing was over. Why, why do you think, Harry, in the context of the introductory remarks I made about the Anzac tradition, why is it necessary that we know about Patterson? Oh, look, I, I think it's necessary because he played a very important role mm -hmm. in uh, what the Australian, particularly the Australian troops, were able to do. So much so that uh, Chater, uh, General Chater, praised him after the war. There are, there are letters in the War Memorial in Canberra by Chater really praising Patterson and his men and how they, you know, what they achieved would not have been possible without his men, you know. They were really critical. In, re in relation to that, the Anzacs treated him very well. He weren't a really Semitic at all. No, no, I think the Anzacs to, saw the Zionists as very similar. Mm. You've got to understand that these Zionists who started going to Palestine from 1880 onwards were not like the Jews who were living in ghettos in little villages in Poland. <laughs> Large numbers of them walked most of the way there. You know, they arrived there extremely fit. They were very athletic. Um, Patterson said they were among the best horse riders he'd ever seen. And he describes that after the war and the fighting was over, um, they continually had sporting contests like boxing matches and wrestling and all other things. And he said uh, the finalists were always either the Australians or the Zionists. <laughs> he said the Englishmen were never there. <laughs> They'd already been eliminated because they were physically, I think, mean, strong people. Because just because of the nature of the life that they had lived. Yeah. In your research, and essentially the rediscovery of Patterson, does this in any way help your understanding of Middle East today? Well, look, I think that's the most important lesson I got. That if you bury the Patterson story, you bury what today is known as the Israel-Palestine conflict, and you bury any chance you have of knowledge as to why there has never been peace. And uh, look, I'd rather read you something than speak about this, because it, it sort of needs to be very precise. And I got so involved in that that I wrote a bit of an essay on it. I said the, the real importance of Patterson's buried under the carpet of history story is that it reveals the true origins of what today is referred to as the Israel-Palestine conflict and explains why this conflict has never been peacefully resolved. And this is because the Koran states that any land which has been subject to Islamic rule must remain so until the judgment day and that rule over such land must never be transferred back to other religions or prior indigenous peoples. Now, the conflict therefore started in 1920 when British Christians started to rule the land. It was no longer, no longer under Islamic rule. Haj Amin al Husseini, the father of Palestinian nationalism, had only wanted a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital, as his third choice. His first choice was for it to remain an Ottoman province with Istanbul as its capital. 
and he actually enlisted in the Turkish army in World War I to play a role, a personal role, in helping to achieve this. Surely that goes back to the Crusades. The Crusaders um, conquered what was um, Islamic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, his second choice was a province of a pan-Arabic state ruled by King Faisal from Damascus. But under the terms of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, that could never come into force, and the British, to compensate Faisal, made him ruler of Iraq, which he ruled till he died in 1933. So the third choice was to have... Um, I'll say, however, when British Christians took over rule of Palestine and the other options were no longer possible, the only way he could see to get Palestine back under Islamic rule was to cause chaos by killing Christians and or Jews. Allenby, however, and this is the important bit, was against the Balfour Declaration and wanted an Islamic state in Palestine and at least one of his officers, Colonel Bertie Waters Taylor, conveyed this fact to Al Husseini and encouraged him to leave the British alone and to engage in pogroms against the Jews. If he did this, the world would soon see that a Jewish state in Palestine was not a viable possibility. Indeed, I, I feel I must say here, I've written in the essay, that I believe that it's an absolute disgrace that there's an Allenby Street in Tel Aviv. It should be renamed Patterson Street. <laughs> Furthermore, Al Husseini was also aware of the fact that a lot of the Christians wore khaki and carried guns. So that made the Jews easier targets. So he followed Colonel Bertie Waters Taylor's advice and chose to kill Jews by instigating numerous pogroms throughout the 1920s and 30s, including major ones in Jerusalem twice, Petah Tikva, Yaffa, Svat, Hebron, as well as other smaller ones. It is important to state here that Waters Taylor was General Bowles' Chief of Staff, and Bowles was General Allenby's Chief of Staff. So we know where the orders from this originate. And Patterson found out that whenever he wanted to go and complain to Allenby, he could never get access, he could never get past bowls. In 1936, Al Husseini finally decided to stage an Arab revolt against the British as well. And when the British authorities issued a warrant for his arrest, he was forced to run away to Germany, where he gave radio broadcasts for his good friend Adolf Hitler, encouraging Bosnian Muslims to join the Waffen SS. He absconded to Egypt after the war to escape prosecution in Germany as a war criminal, where he then set up a Palestinian government in Gaza until Nasser ejected him from Egypt in 1959. He then moved on to Lebanon. He could not become leader of the newly formed PLO in the early 1960s because of recently available worldwide television and the incredible publicity it generated with respect to the capture, trial and hanging of Adolf Eichmann from 1960 to 62. The world at that time would never have accepted any organisation which had one of Eichmann's best mates as its leader. In 1948, the Palestine-British Christian conflict became a Palestine-Israeli Jew conflict with the establishment of the State of Israel. The PLO's first charter in 1964 stated that they were a jihadist organization which made no claims this is important made no claims on the west bank including jerusalem and also gaza because at that time both these regions were under islamic rule namely jordan and egypt respectively 
The PLO stated at that time that they only wanted Palestine to occupy those parts that the Jews ruled, and in the process they stated they would kill all Jews there who were recent immigrants and any indigenous Jews who opposed PLO rule by driving them all into the sea. After the Six Day War of 1967, the PLO expanded its charter to now include the West Bank, including Jerusalem and Gaza, both of which have now come under Israeli rule. Also of interest is the seldom mentioned fact that about half the 1,200,000 Palestinians or Muslims living in Palestine in 1948 had only been there since or after 1917. But that's another story which is outlined in Arthur Kirstler's book, Promise and Fulfillment. Half the population had started coming after 1917 because under the British and the Jews there was employment with much higher wages and better conditions than in the surrounding countries. So they'd come from the surrounding countries. Today, the BDS, a PLO subsidiary, states that Jews are not indigenous to the land, but are colonialists. The Turks, also Muslims, when they ruled Palestine in the 19th century, had no qualms whatever in admitting Jews were indigenous. They had no inkling at that time that they would ever forfeit their Islamic rule of Palestine. The proof of the BDS stating Jews are not indigenous is that under, or the proof of the BDS lies rather, stating Jews are not indigenous is that under the Ottomans, the Western or Wailing Wall in Jerusalem was called Solomon's Wall. And I can show you, I've got three paintings here if anybody wants to see them that were all painted in the 19th century in Palestine under the Turks and the title of every painting is Solomon's Wall and it shows indigenous Jews praying at Solomon's Wall. Now Solomon, yeah, we're coming to the next, yeah, we're, yeah, sure. Solomon the Magnificent at the time of the Spanish Inquisition in the 16th century had no qualms with Gracia Nazi helping Spanish and Portuguese Jews to migrate to Tiberias because as Suleiman stated, after all, they are the descendants of the indigenous people originally from there. Suleiman recognised the Jews as indigenous and leased some land at Tiberias to Gracia Nazi, but he refused to sell it to her because the Quran didn't allow future Jewish rule over parts of Ottoman land. Palestine had to remain under Islamic rule until the Judgment Day. The BDS also claims that the Jews are colonialists. Where I ask you are Israel's colonies. But Islam, on the other hand, is colonialist. Its origins are that of a militant politico-religion with no separation between Sharia or religious law or, and state, which spread militarily from a small town called Mecca over the entire Middle East and Northern Africa, and then across the Mediterranean to Spain, also across Eastern Europe, and if not defeated at the Battle of Vienna in 1683 by the combined armies of the Habsburgs, Lithuanians and Poles, might have overrun Western Europe as far as the English Channel. It spread eastwards to Iran, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Turkestan, Afghanistan, <coughs> Pakistan, as far as Mongolia and China, and down to Malaysia <coughs> and the Indonesian archipelago. Islam is by far the most successful and enduring colonial power in the history of mankind, having lasted 1,600 years, whereas the British Empire only lasted 400 years. A mere trifle in comparison, and militants who died fighting to spread Islam 
were told they would be granted immediate entry to paradise. Those wounded fighting to spread it were told they'd go to paradise when they died, whereas all other Muslims would have to wait till the judgment day when Allah would decide then whether they were eligible for paradise or not. The woke extreme progressive left, which condemns Israel, also condemns British colonialism, and rightly so its slave trade, but never condemns Islamist colonialism and its slave trade, which was far more extensive and longer lasting. My late father, a survivor of Hitler and Stalin, explained why the extreme progressive left behaves in this manner and why it is anti-Semitic. He would say when I was a teenager, so a long time ago, that most people think the political spectrum is a straight line, with the extreme left at one end and the extreme right at the other. This is not true. It is a circle with the extreme right and extreme left meeting at 12 o'clock. The only essential difference between a Stalinist communist and a Hitlerite Nazi, my father would say, is that they are exactly the same. And the proof of this is the Molotov von Ribbentrop Pact, making Stalin together with Mussolini, Hitler's strongest ally during the first two years of World War II, until Hitler broke that pact and attacked the Soviet Union. As regards the BDS, describing Israel as an apartheid state. Let me inform you that in Israel, an Arab judge sitting on the Supreme Court sentenced a former Prime Minister Olmert and a former President Katsav to jail sentences. How could this ever happen in an apartheid state? Furthermore, as a conclusion, are you familiar with Imam Muhammad Tawidi of Adelaide the author of The Tragedy of Islam, who stated a few days ago, we built a mosque on their Solomon's temple, yet they're the invaders. How does this make any sense? Happy Jerusalem Day to its lawful owners and chosen people. The only way to achieve a peaceful two-state solution in Palestine is for the Palestinians to change their leadership group to people like Imam Muhammad Tawidi, and not leave it to the BDS to spread propaganda reminiscent of Joseph Goebbels, who stated that if you want people to believe a lie, repeat it as often as you can. Well, there was an awful lot in there. <laughs> uh, and first of all, I open it up for some questions. Short questions, short answers. Albert? You were quite right in saying that you were going to learn a lot. Um, and I thank you both very much for um, uh, teaching me about somebody that I have never heard of. Um, I want to make a few comments about things that you didn't say rather than things the that question, you said. Albert, the I'd question. Like your, I'd like your question. Uh, opinion on what I'm saying. Uh, first of all, um, Dr. Christopher, when you introduced the topic, uh, you talked about the typical um, um, Anzac, and you didn't at that stage mention that they were led by a Jew. In, um, in Monash. Um, of course, later on, Dr. Harry, you did um, talk about Monash. And um, I'd like your opinion. Um, one of the reasons that Monash was not recognised to the extent that it should have been is that um, Alan Lee was an anti semite and as well as being the um, uh, chief war correspondent. Um, What's the question? What's the question? Alan, 
Quick questions, I said, quick answers. So, sorry, yeah. this just comments, well, comments, just comments. Very quickly finishing. Yeah, but um, where is the Murdoch, question? Uh, Rupert Murdoch's father um, was the chief um, correspondent, and he was not anti Semitic, but he couldn't understand yes. why um, the Jews, oh, what, couldn't understand why somebody with a German heritage was um, uh, leading the Australian. So your, your uh, comments on that? When the newspaper reports were written, they were written by people who were essentially eyewitness observers. In terms of the background, insofar as John Monash and in particular the Murdoch newspaper, what we're seeing is, is essentially the early stages of selectivity. Of selectivity, so news reports. The Argus was the, the paper that actually carried the first reports from the front. They had very good journalists there, and Ashley Bartlett was the prime mover of that. So what came later, when the initial landing was, un, was finished, a lot more correspondents were there filing stories, and that's when your question would have been dealt with. I'd like to invite a friend of mine who's at the back there. She's from Abram, she's from the Turkish background, and she's a co-author of books on Anzac. Hatis Basari, doctor. Like petroleum, things like petroleum um, were certainly sort of more important as we progressed in time. But in those earlier days, it probably was a little bit less Okay. No, the situation is we really have to wrap up because we've got to get out of here. So, I, as the chairman, I'll just take the liberty of saying just a couple of things and then hand over to uh, Grisha Rose, who is our secretary. What stood out for me, if I may say, is A, 
that Patterson wasn't Jewish, and of course I had no idea he was Christian. You know, so there's one thing. The importance of the Balfour Declaration, which you mentioned, which I imagine most of us know what this is about, but obviously to create a Jewish homeland, let's put it that way. And the third thing that I thought was highly interesting is that the Quran, as you told us, uh, says that once a territory was under Islamic rule, it must never revert to anything else. So, so that, that I, I didn't like it, you know. So I thought that mm -hmm. all those <laughs> stood out to me. I thought it was really interesting. But Risha, yes, if you would kindly move a lot of things to our We speakers. could have listened to you all night, as they say. It's fascinating. Thank you very, very much. I, I, I must confess I never heard of the subject we're talking about and Patterson. And, and I think we are so enriched to yeah. learn so much. What, uh, what does anti-Semitic mean? That's anti-Jewish. Yeah, anti-Jewish. Anti-Jewish, yeah. mainly, in one word. And so I've got uh, some bits for you. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> and I think that your story should be really promoted to everyone. I'd like to mention also, if you're not a member of uh, Council of Christians and Jews, you have an opportunity today to sign up, of course. And we produce this once a year, this journal called Gesha, uh, which we're very proud of. So please join us. We've got wonderful um, occasions like that where you can learn so much from all of us. So thank you very much to each one of you for thank coming. You. And thanks to you, love. thanks Mary. Thanks Liz, who is had a birthday yesterday. Oh, okay. <laughs> so,